Well, out of uh, just uh, praise to the Father and uh, appreciation to uh, all that led us today under Brother David's uh, guidance, will you just give the Lord an offering of praise? Choir, we love you. Thank you, guys. Beautiful job. What a beautiful day. A lot, lot of spiritual mile markers. Take your copy of God's Word, and I want to invite you to go to the Gospel according to Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter. And while you're making your way to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, in just a moment, we're going to fix our attention on verse 13 through verse 16. Now, as you're making your way uh, in your copy of God's Word, you will immediately recognize this is the same text. Uh, we simply uh, were at the end of what is called Sermon on the Mount. It is uh, the single greatest sermon ever given in the hearing of humanity by the single greatest preacher because the Word preached the Word. And it doesn't get any better than when the Word preaches the Word. Uh, he is coming into, uh, he's just coming out of what is called the B attitudes. Now these are, these are the attitudes that ought to be characteristic on the life of a believer. These are the things that I think immediately become part of a spirit-filled believer's life. Those who are under the control of the spirit living in what Paul uh, admonishes us to daily be filled with the spirit. But it's also, I believe, w what will characterize the millennial kingdom uh, which is going to be a 1,000-year rule and reign where, where Israel will realize all of the fullness of the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. And at the same time, the bride of Christ, which we are, we take on the characteristic of our Savior by being servants while we live in the satellite city that will hover above the earth that has been refurbished for the purpose of the uh, Davidic kingdom, the Messianic kingdom that will be in its fullness, you and I, We'll be robed uh, in, in our white priestly garments, our wedding garments, to serve that kingdom and be a testimony to those who are living in the millennial kingdom. That's a lot to take in an introduction, amen? <laughs> so <clears throat> Jesus is now bringing into reality, he's about to make a major paradigm shift. There's a significant moment that's about to come about in his teaching. It is our custom in this house to rise out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. If you cannot, there's no condemnation. I promise no judgment. But if you can, would you stand with us as we begin the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, Father, we pray that no spirit but the Holy Spirit have any authority in this house. That in the sweet name of Jesus, not only God in the geography, in the physical capacity of this room, would you hinder anything that would in any way hinder your working. We pray that in our minds and our hearts, we just let some of this old crazy world simply lay still in the parking lot that we might in this room hide in the cleft of the rock and get a word from your word. In Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated ever so quickly. Uh, Jesus is uh, moving from the um, identity of who believers are, uh, blessed are the meek. It's the be attitudes. He's moving from the identity into the practicality, into the activity. And what he's doing, it's not, it's not immediately obvious to the casual reader, but what he's doing is he's, he's clearing up a major uh, misunderstanding. We oftentimes get this backward uh, in the religious life in American Christianity. He is telling us what we, who we have to be before we get busy doing. Who are you before you get active with the activity of being a believer? Now, uh, we oftentimes have been taught that uh, what we do determines who we are. That is not true. In fact, if we were to walk up to one another, and this is not a, a, a condemnation, it's no, not in any kind of a way a criticism, it's just simply true of who we are. Uh, who are you? One of the first things we would answer is what we do. Uh, we'd fill in our vocation. This is what I do vocationally. This is where I work. This is how I make a living. 
Well, what Jesus is trying to do is completely remove the stigma from performance-based religion, which uh, Hebrews at that time, were, uh, it was endemic. It was, it was paralyzing because they were no more for what they did than who they were. So what he's doing is he's saying, listen, this is who you are. This is who you're going to be in an attitude, a supernatural work of the Spirit. But because of who you are, this is what you'll do. And we we suffer severely in the church from our identity being what we do. You know, the, the things we don't do most, most candidly. We, you know, we, things, movies we don't go to, words we don't use, we don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't go with girls that do. We have a whole list of things we don't do that we believe somehow or another qualifies us as children of God. Well, now what qualifies us as children of God is not what we do, it's what he did at Calvary. It was settled at Calvary, and it's scandalous for some of us. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, this is how scandalous it is. There is nothing we could have done, nothing we need to do, nothing we could ever, ever accomplish that will get us one inch into the gate of glory apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not saved based on behavior. We are saved based on the blood of the Lamb. So what he does is he's about to move this from who we are to now the manifestation of what it looks like, what we do as children of God. Now, I have a very simple outline, a very practical, to be candid with you this morning. This is the burden of your pastor's heart. We, I, I know I, I wasn't always necessarily this aware of my setting or surroundings. It's taken a little time and a uh, uh, you, you almost have to be born in the 1900s to understand what I'm going to preach this morning. Uh, there was a time when uh, uh, I would have gotten up knowing that from Memorial Day to Labor Day, y'all were going away. And, that, and, and you know, this is what we'd do. We'd fuss. Man, we'd just throw a fit. I don't know what's wrong with you, bunch of moss back, stiff neck. Y'all won't even come to church. You're probably all going to hell. You ought to feel horrible. Well, here's the truth of the matter. You need a vacation. Amen? We need a vacation from some of you. (laughs) Amen? Some of you need a long vacation. So I need you to hear my heart this morning. What, What I want to convey to you in a biblical truth with what I believe is the grace of God's word is I want you to get a hold of a truth this morning to understand that though the church is currently convened called Fairview Knox in this room, this is not where we do our greatest ministry. This is where we come to get equipped, to be encouraged, to edify, to admonish one another. But this is not where we get the job done. Where we get it done is where you're going to go from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And I'll be tickled to see all of you back in October. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? (laughs) Now, I'm not trying to guilt you. And I'm not giving you a get out of church free card either. I'm not making light of that. But I've also grown uh, in my walk with the Lord to understand there's some very practical truths I want you to get a hold of. And we're going to illustrate those in a very practical way. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down two or three just very practical truths. But if you're not taking notes, guess what I'd like you to do? I I still like you write it down. Now, we're going to talk about the declaration first. I want you to look, if you would, at verse 15. It's a very uh, back up to verse 13 for contextual um, historical narrative. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Jesus was absolutely a master at speaking the language of his people culturally. He could, he could absolutely pull the bow back of his sermon and put the arrow to hit us exactly where we live in a way that made it so applicable, but at the same time very uncomfortable. For example, this makes no sense to us, but I promise you historically, if I could just take a few minutes to prove this, when he says you are the salt of the earth, every ear perked up, every ear. Because salt in this point in time in their culture, in the Roman world and in the Hebrew world, was worth more than gold. A man got paid in salt. It was the single greatest commodity that, that uh, you, you could receive. In fact, now you have to be born in the 1900s to finish this statement, but I want you to finish this statement. All you old people say amen. amen. The rest of you can repent for lying in a minute. Finish this statement for me. He's not worth his salt. Exactly. Exactly. Listen, that's, this, that phrase came from the Bible. In fact, the word salary, the root of the word salary is the word salt. And the man got his saltery, his salary paid in this day and time. So Jesus just pulls them in. He is a master communicator. And he just reaches out and gets a hold of them and says, you know what? Listen to me. Don't, 
Don't let your salt lose its savor. Now, what, what they know is if they got paid in salt that had been, been exposed to, to moisture or had been um, lost its savor, it was worth it. They couldn't pay any bills. They couldn't do any commerce with it. So they immediately perked up. Now, he's not just going to leave it in the, in the commercial realm. He's not just going to leave it in the monetary. Now he's going to drill down a little deeper. Now that he's pulled them in and gotten their attention, and there is nothing like getting a Baptist attention like thumping the wallet. <laughs> say amen. So now that he's got them, he's going to say, I have a declaration. Look, if you would, in verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. Uh, Very keen language here, very specific. Uh, But they put it on a lamp stand. Now, I I cannot overstate this. I cannot over-exaggerate this. In fact, I, I cannot duplicate what probably happened in that moment when he is teaching. There would have been a collective gasp. People would have paused and, and just jaws would have dropped, eyes would have popped. They would have sucked air like a Kirby vacuum cleaner because what he just said that simply sounds like, you know, just a nice religion. You're the light of the world. Put it on a lampstand, kumbaya. That is not what happened in that moment. You ever had somebody dismantle your religious framework with a truth that offended you? Let us pause. <laughs> uh, when I uh, first started pastoring, the, uh, Christy and I, uh, she knew of me, but the only reason she showed up at the church was to prove to her dad that uh, I'd either died in a tragic accident, in a drunken accident in Louisiana, or I was currently serving some prison time. She said, Jeff LeBorg is not pastoring a church. The little church that called me, quite candidly, was getting ready to close. 14 people had gathered together, and I make no exaggeration, the student department, the youth department started at 65. Half of them had cataracts and thought I was six foot three, And the other half were deaf and couldn't have heard Gabriel toot his horn if he'd have blown it in the room. (laughs) I was so proud to be their pastor. It later occurred to me, because I'm a little slower than your average Baptist, that I was really their last hope. I was the bottom of the barrel. I mean, they were closing. They were broke. Nobody was coming. And uh, because of that, they thought, what can we lose? They'd heard about God's revolutionizing, incredible grace that snatched me up out of the pit of hell and it gave me a testimony. I really didn't know how to preach, but they, they just needed some last hope. And if I, if I was not the answer, they were closing the building. I didn't know anything about Baptist. I didn't know anything about religion. I wasn't raised around anything of that nature. And I didn't understand the accruements. I didn't understand some of the activity. And one of the things that aggravated me to the end of my life I, I, it, is they had this table that sat down front. And on the front of it, it said, do this in remembrance of me. Well, I didn't know what that meant, and I didn't know what that table meant, and it stayed in my way. I don't do it as much today, but back in that day, I was a traveling preacher. I traveled all over that room, and uh, that table was always in my way. And not only was it in my way, it was always loaded with stuff. And depending on the season, and uh, the ladies in the church who grew some of the prettiest, most incredible flowers, they would take a big old arrangement, and they would fluff that thing up like a big old funeral spray. And it, especially in the spring when the irises would grow, they're big old tall irises, and you know, they're taller than me. So, <laughs> so I would get up to preach, and, and uh, it, was, it was a big, wee tiny little church, and uh, the platform and the, and the helm were all uh, on, on the same level. So the, the table was on the same level, the helm was on the same level, and I'd stand up, and, and all you could see was irises. All you could see were flowers. And it went on for a few weeks, and I said something to somebody, some old cranky um, <laughs> WMU director, which stands for Military Union, is, uh, Women's Military Union. She said, uh, well, those flowers are up there for, you know, something. I don't know what they were for. And I just had had it. I was sick of preaching behind the, the arrangements. And it was impeding my progress. And uh, so one Sunday, I just got up, and under the, under the helm, under the big old pulpit, I had a set of, of, of garden shears. I just cut the top out of them <laughs> right in the middle of a sermon, son. I just, I trimmed them off like heads, son. And that, I mean, the room just went, <gasps> you could hear it. It was collect. Now, I want to say something to the young preachers, the young ministers. Do not ever do that. <laughs> that is not how you handle that. What Jesus is going to do, he's going to make a declaration that I promise you 
was as, it was more scandalous than me cutting those iris tops out of there. He is going to say, listen to the declaration, you are the light of the world. Now, let me tell you why this is scandalous. Because only the Levitical or the Arianic or the Temple Mount priest were operating under that title. This was an ecclesiastical title. This was a clerical title. This was something that was, that was sewn into the sash of their robes, and it was directly related to something that I'll tell you in just a moment was even more scandalous. So what he's saying is, listen to me. You, you are the light of the world. Don't you let some, po some pro potentate, some priest, don't you let some, some place called the temple, don't you allow somebody to tell you that you are not important to the kingdom of God. There's no, there's no uh, hierarchy at Calvary. There's two places at Calvary, two elevations. There's the one he's hanging on and the one we're standing on. That's it. One, he's stripped naked, beaten beyond recognition, paying for our sins. And the other, all of us are standing on level ground at Calvary. And Jesus has the audacity to step out and say in this sermon, you are the light of the world. And immediately, immediately, they just collectively gasp and said, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've never been to seminary. We, we don't have a, an accruement of, de, of, of degrees. We, we, we don't serve in the temple precincts. And Jesus is dismantling the traditions that nullify the word of God. But it gets, it gets even more scandalous. Not only does he tell them you are, that, that, that is a present tense active indicative in the Greek, which currently means this. You are as of right now and forever sealed in the blood written in the Lamb's book of life. You are the light of the world. Now listen, after, after the priestly and the pastors and the potentates had seven coronaries and passed out, Jesus ramps it up and says, you know, you got to put it on a lampstand. Well, see, the reason that they had light of the world on their clerical sashes is because they were akin to, they were taking it from the, the menorah in the temple on the temple mount. They called that menorah. In fact, you didn't have to say, how's the menorah? Did you have menorah service today? Did you, did you perhaps, were you the priest that trimmed the lamps today? No, you didn't have to say that. All you had to say was, did you work with the light of the world today? And every Hebrew knew that was the menorah. That was the most sacred room before you went into the Holy of Holies. There was no other light in that room. You came through the courtyard of the Gentiles. You went into the place of prayer. You went past the altar of sacrifice, past the basin of, of washing, and then you stepped into the holy place. And in the holy place, you had a moment of worship which was open to the stars and the sun and the sky, but only a select few could go into the, into the next room, which is into the Holy of Holies, where it was separated by a massive veil, the thickness of a man's hand, and the only light in that room was the light of the world. Do you know what Jesus is saying? You are the light of the world. You don't have to go back to a precinct. You don't have to go back to a piece of geography. You don't have to go back to a building. You are the light of the world. And you don't need somebody to stand in because I'm going to, I'm going to stand in. And after I stand in at Calvary and I get up on the third day, then I'm coming to live inside of you and you are going to be the light of the world. Now he has their attention. They are riveted. They cannot believe how this man is teaching in such a way. And I'm going to tell you what immediately happened in that, in that teaching because it's already happening in this room. Now, I've got to have some kind of hubris to make a statement like that, but I'm going, to, I'm going to bet I'm right. Here's what the enemy will say. Now, he doesn't know me. I, I'm not the light of the world. He has no clue how bad I've been, how bad I can be. He has never seen me in my worst 30 seconds. There's no way I am the light of the world. That's what the enemy's going to say to you. But can I simply rest upon this? How many of you, I, I just want to ask this. The first, the first service failed this part of the message. I hope you'll do better. <laughs> how many of you believe this is the inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God? I'm telling you, y'all did better than that first. They're a bunch of liberals. I'm telling you. Y'all pray. Man, I told Chris on, on our way down to seminary this week, I said, babe, I tell you, in about 10 or 15 years, I believe we, you know, we were dreaming a little bit. And I said, I think we'll be done and we'll be able to hand it off. After that first service this morning, I told her between services, we're here another 30 years, baby. I'm telling you, <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. Let me, let, me tell you what the enemy, let me tell you what the enemy will do. Jesus steps in. He says, you are the light of the world. Let me tell you what the enemy will do. Immediately, that declaration will give way to a satanic doubt. 
Some of you have hopes and visions born of God. God's spoken to you. He said something to you. you. You've got a vocation that is currently underwriting what you need by way of a mortgage and a car payment, but you've got a calling of God on your life, and God has spoken to you, and he said something very definitive about what he wants you to do. And every time he reminds you, you are the light of the world. You are the lampstand. I'm going to just pause here real quickly. I promise I won't take long. We, we've been busy all week. We had a phenomenal week at seminary. Man, they brought in every spirit spiritual giant that there was. Brother Tim, it reminds me of Dr. Falwell early in the days of liberty. Son, I mean, listen, I got saved seven times this week. I mean, God was on the scene. It's all about our, our seminary has doubled in growth just in the past year. We got a new president that is all about soul winning. And we, we, we graduated this in the undergraduate program this, this week. We graduated 202 uh, pastors, missionaries, and Bible teachers with degrees that we could not acknowledge because they're in the underground church in communist China and they're winning so many to Jesus. We're theologically training them. We couldn't even acknowledge them. So we just stood and applauded them while they tried to watch online because we are making inroads into places the gospel's not supposed to be. Well, when I got home, I was behind on some of my prophecy update and I, we stayed so busy I didn't get to get into my cohort. So I got up about three this morning slipped downstairs and just checked the news. And this is what I discovered. This past week, there was a major development in, in um, not only do you have the red heifer that is part of the process of getting the temple instruments ready, but now you have an open declaration that they, they are no longer denying that they don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Now, if you've ever been to the Holy Land, if you've ever been over there, you know this. Every implement's been built. Everything's ready. All they need are the ashes of the red heifer, Numbers 19, to consecrate it, to put it in the temple. But they now are saying, they used to play coy with you and say, well, we'll worry about the Ark of the Covenant when it comes time. Now they're saying, oh, we're not even playing. We know where it's at. We've got it. We're ready to bring it out. On October the uh, 7th, I believe, uh, you, you, if you go back, don't listen to the American news. Go back and listen to what Iran and Iraq and Hamas said. Listen to what they said. Two of the chief reasons that they broke that border and slaughtered 1,500 heinously uh, innocent Jewish people, some American citizens, is two things. They said, we know that they've got the red heifer and they're going to offer it soon and we want to stop it. And secondly, we have, we've learned that they know where that Ark of the Covenant is, which is the last piece of furniture. Well, this week, this is what they announced. They simply said this. We have discovered, we have confirmed archaeologically that if you look at the Temple Mount at the Dome of the Rock, we believe that is not the place, that is not the place where Solomon's Temple stood. We believe that it's just to the, just to the east of that building. There's 37 acres. We're going to broker a deal that we can all live together on the same 37 acres, and we're preparing because not only do we not believe that's not the eastern gate. Now, if you've ever been over there, that eastern gate is sealed off. It's shut up because in the 600s, there was a preacher over there preaching about the coming of Messiah and the Muslims heard him and said, wait, 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 what'd you say? He said, there's one coming and he's going to be the Messiah, not only the Jewish people, the, Jew, the Gentile people, and he's coming on a white horse through the Eastern gate. Now I want you to look at your neighbor because I got you deep in the weeds and say, neighbor, neighbor. sin will make you stupid. <laughs> so you know what the Muslims did? They ran out there to that Eastern gate. They sealed that thing up, put rebar concrete, and then they said, We've discovered that a Hebrew holy man cannot walk across anything that's dead. That's why he doesn't pastor most Baptist churches. And he, and he said, I just wanted to see if he's paying attention. So they put a Muslim graveyard outside of that eastern gate. They bury those Muslims three, four, five deep to keep him out. Well, what they've discovered archaeologically is while the world's watching them fight for their existence in the Gaza, they've been doing archaeological digs and they have found what they believe to be the authentic eastern gate on the authentic site of the rock that Isaac was offered on and they are preparing to build. Now listen to me, they're preparing to build the temple expediently. Now I want you to listen to me. Don't you get excited about that. Amen. Do not get excited about that. Because you and I are not waiting on a building. You and I are not waiting on somebody to erect something called a temple and wait outside for a priest or a potentate. We are not going to wash in the ashes of a red heifer. We are children of the Most High God. And I'm telling you, the only white horse we're looking for is the one we're going to ride when we split that eastern sky and come back with him. We are the light of the world. It's getting dark. I understand that. But you hear me. You are the light of the world. You are the hope of glory. You are what God wants to use in this day and time. You do not have to come to Fairview Knox Church in order to find the light. In fact, in a few moments, we're we're going to disperse the light. Amen. 
Now, some of you are not as bright as others. <laughs> some of you, you're, you know, your wattage is a little different. <laughs> some of you just half wit. But that's a whole different thing. That's a whole other sermon. Here's the declaration. Here's what the enemy will say. You're, you're not the light of God. You're not the light of hope. I want you to hear me. You are not anything apart from Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing. There's the doubt. That's where it'll slip in on you, and this is what'll happen. Can I just share just a, a, a brief moment? I won't make a lot of this. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but we, we did thank you all for acknowledging. We did not expect that. It, 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 the credit goes to my wife. I mean, I did the work, but she didn't kill me. <laughs> and uh, so we traveled down to seminary for an incredible week, and our first night there, our, our cohort got together, and we had a wonderful meal at a steakhouse. And uh, several of them I did know, but a lot of them I didn't know. And it, so we're at, a, we're at a, a great steakhouse. I'm just talking about all that God's doing. And there's some graduating with their master's. And we were just kind of polling some, doc, some that were graduating with a doctorate of biblical theology, master's of divinity. And it kind of got around the table. And, and I'm, I'm, I've always been transparent with you all. I've always been honest. Uh, my biggest enemy is not the devil. My biggest enemy is Jeff. And I was sitting at that table, and just for a moment, Melanie, now just for a moment, we kind of surveyed most of the table, not all of it, but nobody in there was getting a Ph.D. in advanced prophetics eschatology. I just kind of <laughs> looked at my wife and thought, I'm the man. <laughs> you are married to the man. <laughs> I didn't say it to her, and I, 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 I just thought, you the man. <laughs> I did tell her that after I was hooded and got my degree, she would henceforth need to call me Reverend Colonel, <laughs> Doctor, Holy Man Honey, <laughs> Pastor Jeffrey. <laughs> it, she's working on it. So we get up and we leave the table, and we're walking out of the steakhouse, and this, uh, this big old tall fella just kind of saunders up by us, and just as friendly as he could be, big old smile, and he said, hey, I, I, I think we're in the uh, same school of prophets. We're, we're graduating. We're the only two graduating with a Ph.D. in eschatology. And I just stopped. And I thought, really? I said, uh, well, what did you do your dissertation on? <laughs> and he said, well, actually, I'm a, nuclear in, I'm a nuclear scientist. And I did my dissertation on um, why the event in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a nuclear event. And I proved it conclusively that it will be nuclear. And I just looked at him and I thought, I hate you. <laughs> I, thought, I hate you. Now, let me tell you what Jesus did. Jesus said, now here's the best part. I, if I don't tell this stuff a lot anymore because when I moved here, stuff like this happened to me and people accused me of lying. This is how God deals with me all the time. Hand to God, my wife's sitting right here. In fact, he's going to visit. He, he said, y'all got Oak Ridge. I, I'm, I'm there all the time. I'm a nuclear scientist. I said, dude, what is your name? And he just smiled. He said, well, my name is Eric Rocket. <laughs> I said, you mean to tell me you're Dr. Rocket? <laughs> he said, that's right. I said, I hate you. <laughs> he said, what'd you do your dissertation on? I said, none of your business. That's what. <laughs> None of your business. Listen, I know what you're thinking. After the declaration, you are, you are the light, you are the light of the world. Now, here's what the enemy will do. You, you, you're thinking, well, that's arrogant. That's haughty. You know what, preacher? I, I, don't, I just don't believe we ought to walk in that kind of, in that kind of hubris. I mean, the, it, we could get cocky. Listen to me. I'm going to promise you something. Jesus will knock the you out of you the minute that happens. Meet Dr. Rocket. Hello, somebody. He will instantly respond to that mess and he will say, you're nothing without me. Boy, you couldn't read the Bible you got saved under until I stepped into your life. So let's just remember before you strut like a banny rooster out of this place, I'm the only reason that you got from a GED to a PhD and I can take it all away in a skinny minute. So don't, don't let the enemy, don't let the enemy sow a seed of doubt. Now I'm going to show you, I'm going to illustrate the guys upstairs are getting something ready because, and you got to, I want you to watch this clip, but I don't want you to make a judgment until you let me speak to it. I want you to let me speak to it because there's, a, there's, a, there's an easy way for the spirit of religion to beat you up a little bit. There's some humor in it. Guys, would you all uh, share this with the church family? All right, parents, listen up. Congratulations on your son making this elite travel baseball team. 
Your weekends belong to me. Yeah, uh, what's the name of our team? We're the Thunder Bat, Shark Fin, Dirt Devil, Long Bombers. That's like four names. First tournament is a regional in South Florida. Florida. It will cost $27,000 per family. From there, we'll head to Costa Rica and Ecuador for two more tournaments. I didn't know, I didn't know a passport was gonna be part of it. I don't have a passport. If we win the second tournament, we get an automatic bid into the Travel Baseball National Championship Elite Sectional Silver Bracket. Oh, wow, that'll be a Which is a qualifier for the World Series Travel Baseball International Tournament of Baseball. Where's that? Mumbai. I don't know if we can commit to that much. What's that? That's you don't know, Jeff? It's, it's just I have a job. Well, you'll have to call in, won't you? Possibly quit. This is your life now. Okay. I don't know if I have enough on my credit card to pay for all this. I don't know if I have to take out a loan, Alan. All right, put a lien on your house. All right, you need bats, gloves, cleats, pants, jerseys, specialty jerseys, carts, tents, chairs, speakers. Ooh. This is basically the major leagues. Is it? Okay. All right, here's our roster. Braxton, Jackson, Paxton, Easton, Landon with a Y, Braden, Jaden, Caden, other Braxton, other Jackson, Knox, and Kai. All right, any questions? I have just a few. Jeff, take a couple laps. Will do. <laughs> now, if you can identify with that, say amen. amen. Now, those of us that, you know, we brought up our children down to Little League Dixie Park, we have no idea what what's goes on today. From, from about Memorial Day to Labor Day, I, I know what religion says. I, I'm supposed to stop right here and just beat you up. Boy, you'll pay a thousand, twenty-seven thousand dollars to. I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to say this. Wherever you go, whatever you do this summer, I, this is all I ask. Just be Jesus. Yeah. Just be the light. Yeah. And I'm not going to fuss at you. I, I know there's a summer slump that I'm not condoning. I'm not condemning. It's just life. Yeah. In fact, Chris and I didn't know it, but we're going somewhere, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't opened it yet, but we're going somewhere. <laughs> And, you know, we, we can't plan a lot of times. I'm a minister. I'm a, I'm a lead pastor. I, I live from tragedy to, to, to agony, from, from uh, sickness to sorrow. I, I can't plan anything. I begged y'all for 10 years, please, can you please plan your crisis? Why? You cannot call me and say, next Wednesday we're going to have one. You just won't do it. Listen to me. Here's the declaration. You are the light of the world. And whether it's a ball field or a beach, whether you're going to the mountains or you're making your way to Disney World, I'm telling you in Jesus' name, you are the light of the world. Jesus lives inside of you. Now, he, there's going to be times he's going to sow doubt. And he's going to say to you, well, the, you, you, that preacher doesn't know how bad you act when you disagree with that umpire. I know more about you than you think I do. <laughs> there's a whole lot I don't tell. But I want you to understand something. We're all human. We've all got clay feet. And here's the declaration. You are the light of the world. And it doesn't matter whether you're a professional, a lawyer, a doctor. It doesn't matter whether you're on an assembly line or in an office. I'm telling you, you are the hope of this nation. And all I'm begging you to do is take the declaration. Now, here's the, here's the final thing I want you to get a hold of. Here's the declaration. You are the light of the world. And then he, he deals with the doubt, and, and then here's the decision, and I'm done right here. Here's the decision. Watch this. Look at verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, so here's the declaration. You are the light of the world. You are dispelling darkness. Everywhere you go, you're sowing seeds of hope people that are anxious, people that are wondering what in the world is going on, people that never had any curiosity about biblical prophecy are now asking questions. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe, maybe, maybe there really is something happening in Israel beyond the politics and the conflicts. Perhaps there's something. Yes, it is. You don't have to explain to them the book of Revelation. You don't have to give them a dissertation on the book of Daniel. Let me tell you what you can give them. You can give them something nobody else can give them. A bottle can't give it. A bag can't give it. A bed can't give it. Careers can't get it. You can give them something that nobody else can give them. You can give them the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And don't you operate in the doubt of the enemy. Don't you let him say to you, well, based on who you, you based on who you are, seated in the heavenlies, your name on the Lamb's book of life, I'm telling you, you've got the authority where you stand to be the light and the lamppost that God's called you to be. Now, here's the decision. He just lays it out in front of them. Let your light so shine. Now, I'm going to deal with something in closing I didn't do in the first service because this service has a little bit different feel to it. Religion will oftentimes condemn us because we have a moment of humanity and we mess up. We say something, we do something, we end up going into something we should have never gone into. Let me tell you about the grace of God. The grace of God is not only able to restore you from where you were, it's able, to re, it's able to restore what the enemy took from you. And I'm going to say something to you from the heart, from everything, every fiber in me, not, not just as a pastor, but as a fellow believer on this journey. I want you to hear me. When you make a decision to receive by faith that you are the light of the world. See, we all said we believe it's the infallible, inerrant, authoritative word of God. Let me tell you what the word said. You are the light of the world. And what you think is mundane and just it's perfunctory and you're in the, in the midst of, I just got to get up and go to this job I hate, listen to me carefully. You may be in a place being used of God in the most mundane, carnal, absolute, hateful place to work in all of Knox County, but you may be there as a witness for God. Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we have a man here this morning, Tim Harris. Um, Tim's gift is giving. And we like Tim's gift. <laughs> Let me tell you something people don't know about Tim while I was writing this sermon. I didn't know he was going to be here today. You should have told me. <laughs> when I go to Tim's business and I visit, uh, I always, always saunter through. I'm either at the warehouse or I go through the, the main showroom over in Farragut. I always meet different people that work for him. He employs hundreds of people. And now I do it on purpose. When I get to wholesale furniture, Knoxville Wholesale Furniture, I, I will purposely go find a salesman or woman or somebody that's working, and I'll say, hey, uh, um, how, you, how you doing today? And they'll say, well, I'm doing great. What are you looking for? I say, well, I'm, I'm looking for uh, Tim. I'm his pastor. And in, now, in, in normal places, people will kind of straighten up and go, that's very good. I love Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's what they do. <laughs> When I first moved here, I went to a different barber shop than the one I go to now. My barber uh, uh, goes to church here, but he owns the shop. When I would walk in the barber shop, uh, and they got to know who I was. They'd, when I'd walk in the door, they'd go, <coughs> preacher. <laughs> now, let me translate that for you. Quit telling bad jokes. <laughs> so I walk over to somebody, and I'll say, uh, hey, how kind of day are you having? I'm good. What can I show you? I said, well, I'm, I'm, here to see, I'm here to see Tim. I'm his pastor. And I'm telling you, inevitably, this is why I do it. This is what they'll say. They'll say, um, and you know, uh, he, uh, he's a great soul winner. I say, yeah, I know. People mostly know them for their giving. Every time, every time, the last time I did this was just not long ago, I said to a guy, hey, I'm Tim's pastor. He said, Tim led me to the Lord. Amen. I said, really? He said, yeah. He invited me to go to Alabama to a furniture show. What I didn't know is you can't get out of the car at 75 when he starts sharing Jesus. <laughs> This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, we're doing 75 and you're going to die and go to hell. So, <laughs> listen to me. You got a decision to make. Do you notice the word let? Let. Let. That means you got to decide every day. I'm going to get up. And today, by declaration, I'm a light of the world. I'm not going to let doubt come in. And I'm not going to let political correctness come in. Well, preacher, if I say anything about the gospel, man, they'll lose their mind. Listen, they're going to lose their soul. Wouldn't it be a whole lot better for them to lose their mind and meet Jesus and not lose their soul? Because if you let your light shine... One guy, when I was at the warehouse last, he walked up to me and he said, and Brother Tim, I'm not going to tell his name because I don't want you to be. He said, I hated Tim and Robin Harris. Oh, boy, that's strong. I said, why would you hate them? They're, they're great employers. 
He said, because all he talks about is Jesus. He said, I got sick of hearing about Jesus. He said, do you know if you don't come to these Bible studies, you get fired? He said, I only come in here, cross my arms. And he said, I want to hear nothing else about Jesus. Until one day, I met Jesus. I said, what do you do with that? He said, I act like Tim all the time. (laughs) This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Listen, I want you to have a great summer. If you happen to stop by, we'll be here. (laughs) But wherever you are and whatever you're doing, here's what I'm asking you to do. Just be Jesus to somebody. Because you are the light. Don't play with a doubt. And get up every day and make a decision. And do you know what could happen? We could baptize more at the end of the summer than we've ever baptized before because you simply let your light shine.